Good morning. Happy World Turtle Day. I'll give it a few minutes to let people join in. We are at the Turtle Survival Center in Cross, South Carolina. I'm currently in the hatchling room. You can see all these turtle hatchlings. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's World Turtle Day and we are out at Turtle Survival Alliance's Turtle Survival Center to celebrate. We will be doing a tour shortly with the assistant curator here, Clinton Doak, and the director, Chris Hagen. Um, but we're gonna give it a few minutes to let people join in today. Um, so I'll chat with you for a few moments. Um, we are broadcasting live for World Turtle Day and um, we're very lucky to be able to experience this tour today because the Turtle Survival Center is actually closed to the public. So we're very lucky um, to be able to speak with these people and learn about these animals. And I'm excited, so I hope you are. Um, and speaking of World Turtle Day, it, this is a wonderful day that we're able to celebrate, thankfully, um, Susan Tellum with American Tortoise Rescue started this a few years ago, and we're all lucky to be able to join in and celebrate with the world. So sea turtles, turtles, tortoises, terrapins, we're all very lucky to be able to know them and love them and celebrate them. And speaking of celebrations, Turtle Survival Alliance has been celebrating for a whole month now. So we started the tradition last year of Turtle Month, starting on April 22nd for Earth Day. And going through the finish line of World Turtle Day, May 23rd, we spend a whole month celebrating turtles and it's amazing. So this year we kind of stepped it up and we started sharing some turtle stories. Um, you can go to our website, turtlesurvival.org and see some of those some of that content that we've posted. Um, you can donate to our World Turtle Day campaign. And you can also um, access our World Turtle Day and Turtle Month merch. We have a wonderful World Turtle Day shirt that was designed by Bonfire. You can still purchase that on our website. So you're welcome to do so. Um, again, if you're just joining us, we are at the Turtle Survival Center in Cross, South Carolina. Um, it's actually TSA's only ex situ breeding program. So, variants and about the center. We will tour the center in just a little bit um, and we'll get to ask some live questions with Clinton Doak and Chris Hagen. So, we're just going to give it a few minutes to let people join in. We'll probably start in two or three minutes and while we're waiting let me just show you where i am in the hatchling room you can see some turtles we're celebrating you today we're celebrating all of you we'll learn more about what kinds of turtles these are why we're in this room and what we do here at this facility thank you so much adam So happy to be here with you guys today. Again, if you missed it, you can go onto our website, look at these little guys, and find all of our Turtle Month content, um, some webinars, Turtle Hero Stories, where we have celebrated and recognized all of the wonderful people and companies that have made our work possible through the years. Um, not all of the people, but a lot of people that don't typically get recognized. We recognize them this month, so very happy to do that. Thank you all for joining. And we'll get started here in just a moment. I think I'm going to bring them in and 
introduce you to our tour guides for today. And here they come. Here we come. Here we they are come. Here. Okay, let me introduce you to, this is Assistant Curator of the Turtle Survival Center, Clinton Doak, and Director of the Turtle Survival Center, Chris Hagen. Hello. And they will be giving us a tour of this facility today and answering any questions you may have. So if you have questions, make sure you leave them in the comment section and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So, guys, happy World Turtle Day. All right. Yeah, happy World Turtle <laughs> yeah. Day in your west. Check out that merch. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so tell us about this room a little bit. Why don't you tell us, Clint? Yeah, so this uh, is our hatchling room. So anything that hatches here at the Turtle Survival Center will spend the first year of its life in this room. Um, and currently we've got about 16 species in here. And we're just getting to the point where last year's hatchlings will be moving out to other facilities here in, at the center. And then the new hatchlings will start coming in. Uh, we've already started hatching two species so far this year, Keladynama cordi, or the Rhode Island snake neck, and Cora amboinensis, uh, one of the Asian box turtles that we primarily work with here at the Turtle Survival Center. Nice. And so why, is, why are we hatching these turtles? Why is this important, Chris? Well, this is a, a conservation breeding collection of maintaining small, genetically diverse populations of these species that are critically endangered or in some cases uh, considered functionally extinct in the wild. We maintain about five species here that are thought to no longer occur in the wild or in such low numbers that there is no uh, breeding populations left. There might be five or ten out on the landscape, but that, that's it. Um, or they may be totally gone from the wild. We don't really know. It's really difficult to uh, determine whether or not a box turtle across the landscape is every single one of them is gone. Um, so we maintain these populations here of adult founders, the wild caught animals um, that have come in from zoos and collections over the past few decades. And uh, we breed them and we, may, we breed them in pairs. So we know the, the parentage of each animal uh, that the hatches here and then we keep them all numbered and separated and uh, uh, again to maintain these small populations so maybe someday as culture changes um, new techniques are developed for for reintroduction uh, and protection of these of these wild areas that these animals can go back to the wild that's the ultimate goal to augment uh, existing populations or completely reintroduce populations to where they've been um, depleted. Great. So um, let's look at some turtles and let's talk about, you know, what happens to these turtles after they leave this room. Sure. Well, what do you want to take a look at first? So uh, I guess we can start with some of the Asian box turtles or the genus Cora. Sure. Um, we've got a couple different species here we can show you. If you look right over here, this is Cora galbenifrons. Um, and the, this species here, we are um, one of the uh, largest breeders in North America for this species. We've effectively uh, increased this, the AZA stud books significantly by breeding this species. Um, and this species is found from Vietnam, in Vietnam and, and China on the, near the border of northern Vietnam. Um, but we have produced uh, quite a few offspring from, from this species now, um, and most of them are staying here right now, um, but we do participate in stud books, so a lot of these animals will be going to different uh, institutions once the bloodlines are established. Uh, and that goes for most of our animals here. We are at an AZA accredited facility, so a lot of our young animals will go to other AZA institutions, uh, depending on the stud books and where they want them to go. Nice. Yep. We also have, uh, so we have several species of Cora. That's kind of what we specialize in here. The climate here is really um, perfect for a lot of species of Cora. It's a temperate climate, so it gets a little bit of a cool down in the winter, which is required for some of these species, species that have good breeding and reproduction. And, um, but we also keep some tropical species here. And one of those is the Sulawesi forest turtle that you see here or Leucocephalon uonawai. Our next stop will be in the greenhouse and we will see the adults of these. Um, this is a species that's been traditionally very difficult to um, breed in captivity. 
Uh, currently, there are only, I believe, 14 places in the entire world that have ever bred these in captivity. And uh, still, the numbers are pretty low in terms of uh, successful hatchlings because they lay one to two very large eggs at a time. The incubation is five to six months. Um, a lot of things can go wrong during that time. So um, even here at the turtles, I've been personally working with this species since the year 2000 and I did not see my first hatchling uh, until 2018, my own hatchling um, that, that I was a, participated in uh, breeding. And then um, uh, and to this day, we've only hatched 18. That's uh, since 2018. Mm -hmm. A lot of 18s here. 18 <laughs> years. Uh, 2018, we hatched our first one, and to this day, we've hatched 18. Wow. From a variety of uh, bloodlines, though, I think that's like 10 or 11 different distinct yeah, bloodlines that we're producing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of one of those functionally extinct species, we can show you one down here. These guys are really, they're adorable. Um, this is Chelidina macordi, so the Rhode Island snake neck. Um, and like Chris said, we, we maintain five functionally extinct animals. Uh, so this species actually hasn't been seen in the wild for over a decade now. Um, and actually Chris is, as far as we can tell, is one of the last people to ever see, last Westerners to ever see this species in the wild. Um, it's a really cool species. Again, part of the stud book is, um, and we started a new bloodline for American stud books here at the Turtle Survival Center uh, after acquiring uh, two different animals uh, that came from very different origins that have been in the pet trade a while and now they're part of this breeding colony that uh, hopefully this will be one of the first species to be reintroduc reintroduced from North America back into the wild. Um, but we've produced uh, I think 15 so far this year. I think that's where we're at. I believe so. Yeah. That's about right. 15, yeah. And really, uh, I don't know if you saw the plastron, but they're really pretty yeah. orange turtles. Um, they're big goofballs, yeah. so and that coloration will go away after a few months to a year or so. And um, but yeah, the last wild animals of this species were seen in 2004. Um, so they're considered functioning. And unfortunately, they were collected all out because they live on a tiny little island, collected for the pet trade, going back 20, 30 years before they were even described to science. In 1994 is when they were described. But people were breeding them in captivity years, many years prior to that. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting story. And, and also in the 50s and 60s on that island, there was a pred some predatory fish that were introduced to the island. So they're gobbling up all the hatchlings. The adults are being collected for the pet trade. So it took about 30 years to essentially wipe them all out. So we got a question from Adam. Um, mm -hmm. What is a stud book? Oh, what is so, a stud? Yeah, that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. We just talk about yeah. stud books well, here like everybody knows what they well, are. You're joining yeah. the stud books. <laughs> right. yeah. You take yeah. this one. It's, it basically, it's a, a chart or a, a, a database of every animal um, that can be charted. Uh, every animal that participates. Every animal that participates in the stud book. Yep. Males, females, juveniles, all that. So um, it helps a stud book coordinator um, someone who's managing that stud book to pair up animals based on genetic lines um, yeah. the, the, and to maximize that genetic diversity when you have so few animals left to work with. Mm -hmm. Right. So the stud books are kept by the AZA people? They are, they're different. Yeah, they have different their, stud their books. ones in Europe. They, there's regional ones. There's global ones. Yeah, yeah there's, there's different types. But yeah, we work primarily with the... Um, uh, Association of Zoo and Aquariums, AZA, yep. um, with their stud books. Nice. And typically, uh, there's a stud book keeper, but a lot of the math and science and everything goes with it. There's a whole coalition yeah. of people that help with that, uh, where they specifically just run the algorithms yeah. and look at the genetic data and suggest it. It goes to the stud book keeper, who then puts those into effect. There's a stud book keeper, and above that's a stud book coordinator, and then there's population managers. So yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of people yeah. involved with all of these programs. Um, just like TSA, you know, we're a coalition of, of people, so we can't do it without partnerships. And AZA stud books are another good example of that across all of North America, all, yeah. all the zoos that are part of it. It's many people that are involved. 
Definitely all turtle heroes. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go to the greenhouse next, but as we're walking, um, somebody did have a question about functionally extinct species mm -hmm. and how big of a problem inbreeding is. How do you prevent inbreeding for these species in captivity? So Okay. Well, um, they are turtles. They inbreed in the wild. Um, it's not as much of a problem with uh, turtles and other reptiles as it is with mammals, uh, for instance. So, you know, some people have come up with calculations. You need like seven generations of inbreeding to affect a turtle neg negatively. If that's true or not, who knows? If you consider the history of time, the planet's history, how many turtles how many times did a single female get washed down a river or washed out to sea onto an island and start an entire population from a single female? Um, it's probably happened many times over the past 20, 200 million years. Uh, uh, turtles just, they're, they're better suited for that. When you take a population, if you look at the genetics, um, uh, you, you sample a bunch of turtles in the population, you're going to find that a lot of them are, are very closely related. Right. Um, they, don't, they don't really care. They do breed with each other, their, their, mm -hmm. their own family members, so to speak, um, the ones they're related to. So it's, uh, again, we are concerned about it. We want to try to avoid that as much as possible to maximize the genetic diversity. But when you only have two or three or five animals left, you have to work with what you have. And um, again, we see animal a population that started with 10 or 20 or 100 individuals that can grow into thousands and they all seem perfectly healthy and fine going about their business oh good yeah and that's again that comes with uh, going back to stud books and other things like our management plan as well you know we keep that in mind and we try and keep that genetic variability for a hundred years or more um, and there's a lot of new things we're doing as well where we're studying um, captive population genetics as well um, so all that stuff is ongoing it's constantly evolving you know we're asking these same questions all the time too mm -hmm. so it's it's always just trying to take it a step further for conservation and that's something that we as the TSA and, and other organizations are striving to do um, to help these species and many others that are in peril right now so I think the big answer is that no one really knows for sure what the effects of it yeah we've only been doing this for a few decades at most and these turtles some of these species live 100 plus years mm -hmm. 80 the generational time is huge so right. we're, we're, we have to be watching these things studying them for a thousand two thousand years before we really get a handle on it <laughs> um, i don't think there's ever been any documentation of bottlenecking the phenomenon of bottlenecking in turtles like we've right. seen in and humans have gone through a bottlenecking and cheetahs currently are going through a bottlenecking where the genetic variability is so low that the it essentially shapes like a bottle and then it can't rebound from there. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know of any documentations for turtles in that. Like he said, we know, at least based on um, some of the earlier conservation theories and, and Darwin, that a lot of these populations on islands are established from just a few individuals, especially in reptiles and birds. Well, that's good news. We have a way to bring them back. Good question, Wilhelm. And we are walking into the greenhouse now. I know the things Never. are off. <laughs> um, this is our tropical greenhouse that we're in right now. I like to refer to it as our Sulawesi greenhouse as well because the two primary species in here are from the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia. That island is south of the Philippines, uh, east of Borneo, and kind of north of Bali and Java. Uh, so the Sulawesi forest turtle, Leucocephalon uonoi, is on this side. The Sulawesi tortoise, or Forsten's tortoise, is over on this side. And then we also have a couple other Indonesian uh, species here. The Rhodey Island snake neck turtle, uh, the adults that we saw the hatchlings in the hatchling room. And then the Southeast Asian box turtle, Cora amboinensis. Um, this uh, greenhouse is just for them. Most of the animals we keep here are uh, temperate, um, meaning that they have a cooling period in the winter time. Um, it doesn't get brutally cold here, but it does get down to freezing some nights here. Um, and we have a lot of days in the 40s and 50s in the wintertime. So 
It's good for the, the temperate species like many of the Cora, but here these guys have to be kept 75 to 85 year round is their optimal temperature. So they stay in this greenhouse and we heat this greenhouse in the, in the winter time as well. So the Sulawesi forest turtle was described to uh, science in 1995, one of the true last great turtle discoveries in the world, mm -hmm. um, which we'll take a look at some of the adults in a second. And then the uh, Forston's tortoise, both of them critically endangered. They only occur on one tiny little section of the island of Sulawesi. It's not like they cover the whole island. It's a very limited range in the north, kind of the central northwest arm of that island. It's a very strangely shaped island. Um, but again, they only occur in one area, whereas like the Amboinensis, the Cora Amboinensis, uh, Southeast Asian box turtle, they occur all over the island. Mm -hmm. um, um, but not these two, they're really, they're restricted. And they live together in the same exact habitat through most of the range. They run into each other, even though the um, forest turtle is more aquatic, especially in the evening, and the tortoise is more terrestrial, but they do bump into each other in these shallow streams and in the forest. But the tortoise also has a completely separate habitat in the southern part of the range in central Sulawesi that's a very dry, uh, arid, scrubby kind of habitat that gets really hot. Uh, it's almost like foothill desert type. <laughs> so anyway, you want to take a look at the yes, tortoises first? Yes, look at these guys. Uh, we have uh, 12 pairs here that we match together for breeding purposes. Um, oh, here's one that's in her hut right here, sticking her head out. It's one of the females. This, tur this tortoise is under extreme pressure. Only last year was uplisted to critically endangered. Unfortunately, the government of Indonesia still has a export quota on this species, meaning that they export a certain number every year, despite them being critically endangered and in the decline, or in decline um, in their natural habitat. They become harder and harder to see in the wild. I've been going to the island of Sulawesi since the early 2000s. I've been there a few times, and it wasn't until 2019 that I actually got to see a wild one, whereas uh, the Sulawesi forest turtle is still relatively easy to see. If you go to the correct habitat, you can find some uh, relatively easy. But even traders, collectors that who over the decades have collected these tortoises. They said 10 years ago, they could easily find seven or 10 in a week in a certain area. Now they're lucky if they find seven or 10 in two or three months. Wow. So it's becoming much more difficult to find them. They use dogs and even, even then they're still having, you know, they're, they're collecting them all out. And it's not so much the international trade, although there is some of that, but there is a huge national trade within Indonesia where these animals are going to the pet markets more people are becoming wealthy in areas like around Jakarta or um, and, and, and afford them to have these pets and so these are very very popular as pets within Indonesia as well so they're, they're getting hammered for that mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting collected out of the wild But the TSA and others have been working to develop a program there that hopefully someday we'll, we'll get to see um, uh, some type of conservation effort going on on that island. Uh, more, I mean, people are trying, it's just a difficult place to get a foothold in and, mm -hmm. and uh, we're finding people there on the ground that want to do this work that are local. We are breeding this species as well. We yeah. didn't show you an example in the hatch room, but we yeah. do breed this species as well. We have a few in there. Yep that we overlooked. We didn't look at everything. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's 16 species, so there's three a lot out of to cover. 16 species. Uh, and one neat thing about the greenhouse too is, you know, a lot of the plants that are in here are planted for dual purpose. For So they are for uh, shade, shelter, and as well as food. Um, so here we have, a, like this is a jackfruit, for example. This is a little hammock to stop it from breaking because the fruit will actually get too heavy for the tree. Um, so we're growing jackfruit, we're growing papaya, we've got different hibiscus, bananas, you know, and all that's for the turtles. Um, here's some younger jackfruit here as well. Um, so a lot of the species we try of plant that we try and grow in here are Southeast Asian as well. Um, just trying to get some variety into their diets uh, compared to a lot of the, the local produce we get donated to us from Limehouse Produce. Awesome. 
Let's take a quick look at an adult snake neck turtle. Yes. This is the mother of all those hatchlings we were just looking at. Um, she's probably a pretty old turtle. Uh, she lived at a university for over for about 20 years and before she came here so she's probably probably around 40 plus years old um, minimum and um, didn't breed you know she didn't ever had a mate when she lived at that university so we do have a mate for here her now this is another uh, founder McCordi here and these are these two um, their breed the breeding of these the offspring of these are our new offspring for the stud book. So these were unrepresented wild caught founder animals that have now produced, you know, 30 or more offspring. And those offspring will either, or both probably go into the um, managed SSP, species survival plan within the United States. And some will probably go into the reintroduction program through Wildlife Conservation Society in Bronx Zoo. But her first couple of clutches after not being non-reproductive for 20 years were, were a little shaky and right. We didn't have any really any development, but by the third clutch, everything was kicking in and working again properly. Thank you all for joining us again. We are um, getting ready to leave the greenhouse. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. And um, these are the Sulawesi forest turtles. Yeah, this is Leucocephalon uonawai, described in 1995. They are um, a nice, they, they live in like hilly areas of Sulawesi. They live, during the day, they're off in the forest, the adults foraging and doing whatever they do. And then in the evening, they go down into these shallow streams where they're presumably mating and eating and sleeping and you know foraging about and um, then they uh, they go back into the forest during the day although the juveniles the hatchlings and the juveniles remain in the water all the time for the first few years of their life it looks like you can see here on this one see this hole here this is something that collectors do uh, when they catch turtles sometimes especially people in remote areas they drill a hole and then they tether the turtle to a tree or a pole so it can't these turtles are incredible climbers mm -hmm. um, they can get out of just about anything given the opportunity they can just climb out of these tubs occasionally yep. um, but they uh, they're great climbers so this is a way for people when they capture them to kind of keep them where they want them until they take them to the market or someone comes around and, and, right. and buys them but mm -hmm. this species luckily doesn't have a lot of demand because it's a big aggressive nasty like dirty <laughs> species it makes a lot of mess it needs to be tropical they're hard to breed they're hard to keep alive so there isn't a lot they don't taste good so people don't want to eat them so uh there's not a huge demand for them luckily although there is still some demand for the pet trade within indonesia mm -hmm. um, but like locals don't eat them they just basically leave them alone unless somebody wants to buy them to take them them away somewhere and as you can see, the males and females actually look quite differently. Yeah, it's so, actually dimorphic. Yep. Yeah, so you have a female here who's about half the size. Your male um, has typically would be that bright white head where the scientific name comes from, leucocephalon or white head. Um, whereas the females are a little more drab. They're smaller, uh, just as aggressive. We actually have to do supervised breeding with all this species. Um, that's why they're in separate tubs. Uh, it, but... Overall, it's, it's a great species that we're working with. And like Chris said, you know, we, although we haven't been super successful, we're still trying to dial it in with them being um, such a uh, hard species to manage and populations to begin with. But we're getting there. Um, and we've also seen that there's most likely a mate choosiness or a choice that comes. You'll have pairs that will reproduce for, for years and years, and you switch one of the members, and then they stop breeding. Mm -hmm. You get no more offspring. Mm -hmm. Or even pairs that are proven we've gotten hatchlings from, we don't always get hatchlings from all of their eggs. Yeah. They don't always develop. It's, they're just a, kind of still of an, an enigma, like most turtles, really. And don't mind us for all the loud noise in between. We always wash hands between species mm -hmm. uh, just to, to reduce any type mm -hmm. of... Uh, cross contamination or anything like that. So you'll see us kind of popping off screen to wash hands and stuff. So if you hear a sink, that's what's going on. <laughs> For those that are wondering. Well, while you guys are washing your hands, uh, 
Wilhelm actually had another question. He okay. says he's from the Philippines. Oh, yeah. Do you guys have any Philippine forest turtles here? We do not have any Philippine forest turtles, but um, I have worked, I worked on the confiscation. I had been there before as well. Um, uh, in 2012, my first time was in, in Manila for the uh, crocodile meetings. Um, and crocodile specialist group meetings. And afterwards I went and met up with Sabine and, and we, we went out into the field and, and got to see them for the first time. I got to see them for the first time in the wild. That was great. Mm -hmm. And then went back again to help with the confiscation in 2015. Um, there are very few uh, latensis in the United States. Um, there are only, a, I think three in, a, in, in an AZA institution. And then there are about um, maybe a dozen or 15 in private hands as well, but there are very few in the United States. Hmm. And no one has ever bred them in the U.S. or I think uh, only in the Phil. I think Sabine is the only one that's, that's hatched them in the Philippines and on Palawan. Hmm. Do you want to walk to the... I'm going to turn the fans back on. Um, for our climate controlled greenhouse. So right. these guys do have a microclimate uh, about 65 to 85. We try and keep it in year round. Uh, it's really loud. So we turn the fans off for this tour. So I'm gonna get <laughs> them back on before it heats up and I'll catch All up right. with you guys at the next building. Sounds good. We're gonna follow Chris and we're going to core complex number two, correct? Correct. Which is this enclosure right here? Yeah. <clears throat> So we're going to talk a little bit here about what species we can find in this complex and um, you know what happens when they do breed and what do we do then. But These are our outdoor complexes. You'll see kind of a, var a variety of configurations as we go through these different areas. This was the last set of enclosures that we built. Uh, it was completed in 2018. It's 90 enclosures. Um, most of them are, you know, kind of smaller pools and more land for our terrestrial Cora species. What the in here are the galbinifrons complex, the uh, flowerback box turtle or Indo-Chinese box turtle. Here's one here. This is uh, Cora galbinifrons, and we also have Cora beretti, um, either a you know a, a closely related species or subspecies of galbinifrons, depending on who you, <laughs> who, you ask. who you ask and who yeah. you believe. Um, but anyway, they're closely related. And then the third one is the southern Vietnam box turtle, Cora pictorata. We keep most of those indoors um, because they are more tropical and can't live out here in the winter. They could, but they they, they would be problematic, and some we'd probably lose some. Um, and they don't breed very well yep. if they get to, if they stay cool in the winter time. Right. Anyway, um, I think Clint might know where a nest or two is out here that was laid yesterday i believe is yeah that right yeah so uh before we get into that i'll go back a little bit and talk about how we kind of monitor gravid females here uh so we have an on-site x-ray machine which um well first we start with a breeding calendar all our species are mapped out on a calendar so we know when they start laying uh so before they about three weeks before we expect them to lay we start x-raying um, and then when we x-ray, we put a bright orange tag like this one here. And that lets us know that that animal's gravid. Um, so then that lets uh, the keeper staff, interns, uh, know that we need to search for nests for a lot of these animals. So that it usually happens a couple times a week until we find the eggs. Um, but like Chris said, I did a search yesterday. Um, so if we come over here, I can show you a typical uh, Cora galbinifrons nest. So. They don't actually nest like most turtles where you would expect that funnel shape uh, when they make a nest. These guys actually will just kind of dig into the leaf litter and then um, deposit a couple eggs, kick some leaves over it, and disappear. Uh, so if you look down in here, you can see there's a lot of leaf litter. So we use this to brumate 
during the winter, but as well, it's, it's great nesting material. Uh, so right over here is actually where the nest should be. And it was important to cover it back up because they will eat their own eggs. Um, they've actually done it right in front of us as we're collecting the nest. So you always wanna be super gentle um, and move the leaf litter away. Uh, just because if it is like this banded, the embryo has already attached to the wall inside the egg and too much disturbance can actually uh, detach that embryo and then potentially kill the embryo inside. So we've got at least two eggs banding or chalking. So that uh, calcification happens when the embryo is starting to develop. So you can see we've got three eggs here from this Cora galbenifrons. I'll collect those up, uh, put them inside in our incubation room and, and we'll get them worked up. So we take morphometrics on all the eggs here that are collected at the TSC, uh, their, their weight, their length, their width. Um, and then we candle them every week to track development uh, just because a lot of this stuff is not known on the species that we have here. So we're trying to build this nice database for people as a reference. So hopefully now that we've been doing it for, this is our sixth season, collecting this data. Hopefully in the next year or so we can get some of that published and hopefully it helps people that are trying to work with these species. Okay, so a few questions for the people who don't know. What does gravid mean? Oh, gravid just means that her follicles are developing and that she's forming eggs and that she, she is going to lay eggs, eggs, carrying eggs, yep. And then when you candle the eggs, mm -hmm. What are you doing when you do that? So uh, it, it's basically turning the lights off, taking a pen light like this one here and shining it through the egg with a bright light. And you can see the veins, you can see the embryo if it's in there, you can see the embryo moving. Um, and it helps us track their development as well. So we can we know what point that egg is when we find it. So we'll candle them. Like these are, are banded or chalked, but it's pretty uh, early on on the chalking phase. So most likely there isn't much to see in the candling, um, but that just lets us look into that egg to see what's going on inside of it. And it's a very common practice they use with birds as well. Um, and it's just a, a pretty effective way to look and see if the embryo is developing. Usually what you say within 10 to 20 days or so, you typically start seeing veins and uh, for with a lot of these, I mean, yeah. many of the eggs that we get here, some a little longer than others, some maybe a little bit quicker. Yep. But two to three weeks is yep. we start seeing the, um, you can see veins running yep. all through the inside of the egg and you know that the egg is developing. Yep. So like I said, we've, we've been tracking that. And, and with Cora, it's usually within the first three days of uh, when the eggs are laid that you will get that banding. Yeah. Uh, within a week, you'll see the blood circle and embryo spot. And then within about 21 days, you'll start to see the, the veins expand in the band. And then in about 30 to 35 days, they start moving past the band. And then you can start seeing the turtle actually develop. We've gotten some pretty cool shots of yeah. the actual turtle in the egg. Um, and it all just comes with the management of these species and, and getting as much information as we can. So um, we did have a question. Sure. Liz complimented us on our clean enclosures. Thank you, Liz. And how many staff do we have? So how many there, we have a lot of staff that work <laughs> around the globe, yes. but here at the Turtle Survival Center, how many staff do we, we have? We currently have five mm -hmm. right now. Um, we would probably, within the next couple months, we'll have a sixth person. Um, we are um, looking to hire a kind of groundskeeper, um, relief, relief uh, keeper kind of mm -hmm. uh, position. So. We are working on that. We also usually have an intern or two around here mm -hmm. um, throughout the year, but primarily in the summer months, um, sometimes in the fall and winter. And uh, of course, you know, volunteers, volunteers as well. Which um, we'll be opening it up very shortly yeah. again for the volunteer program, right. um, which has been closed due to COVID. But for anyone that's interested, that will be opening up again. Yeah. But for the past very cool. nine years of the, the center's operation, mm -hmm. started in 2013, March of 2013. So a little over nine years we've been in operation at this location. And uh, we've never had more than five employees. Mm -hmm. staff no, never more than five full-time. Never more yep. than five full-time We've had a couple part-timers yeah. in the summer yeah. doing, helping with groundskeeping. Right. Um, but when you say five staff, I mean, that that's literally everything. So that's all the management. Yeah. That's all the husbandry. That's the construction mm -hmm. that doesn't take a certified masonry like, yeah. to build these. You know, But we did all the stucco on the sides. 
all of these 90 ponds are handmade. Yeah. Um, all the plumbing, electrical, it, it's all us in house. Yeah. So it, it takes a lot to keep this place running. So it's not just taking care of animals, yep. it's managing an entire 50 acre property yep. and all the buildings, all everything. And as you can see now, we've got uh, one of our uh, keepers just walked inside, a veterinary keeper, and these are our current interns right now that are getting ready to feed some turtles. Today's a feed day. Uh, so we've got Caitlin and Jason, they're both interns currently, and then that's Carol there in the doorway. And they're getting ready to start doing a feed. Pretty cool. I don't know if you want to walk around here to see the variability. So similar to our eastern box turtles in the United States, Terrapin Carolina, these Cora Galbinifrons. Every single one of them has a different color and pattern, um, and they're all unique in, in that way. So you could identify every single one of them just by taking photos, because um, there's they're, 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 they're such a, a great variability in this species. Some are not just yellow, some are bright red, some are orange, some are brown. And this group um, was actually donated by uh, a woman in, uh, by the name of Vivian in um, Hong Kong. She rescued most of these from a wet market, a food market, in the early 2000s, from 2002 to 2004. She's an architect, um, and she nursed these guys back to health for about 10 years, uh, managing them in her, um, her, her, home in in downtown hong kong on a seventh floor uh, mm -hmm. apartment complex i believe and um and she was looking for a sanctuary for them to go to and and we did all the paperwork and were able to import these in in 2015 and um it was 55 individuals so it really boosted the american um, stud book uh, for this species and really created a robust population uh, to work with and we're actually getting ready to send some juveniles to a few different institutions, AZA institutions, um, to bolster their holdings and uh, breeding efforts. Okay, so I mentioned earlier when I first started, so many of you probably missed it, that this is an ex situ breeding program, which means, correct me if I'm wrong, that we are breeding turtles that don't live here natively. Correct. We we don't. We have one native species, not to South Carolina, but to the United States. We yeah. have. Uh, we're working with um, Sternotherus depressus, the flattened yeah. musk turtle. We have one pair. The only pair in the AZA is is here, um, and we are trying to develop a program with Fish and Wildlife Service and and the state of Alabama to uh, potentially help with an assurance colony for that species because. It's probably the most endangered species in the United States mm -hmm. at this point. Um, uh, it has a very restricted uh, range, more than probably just about any turtle in the United States, yeah. if not the most. So we had a question, mm -hmm. um, does TSA do in situ work in Vietnam, which means you know breeding efforts for Vietnamese turtles in Vietnam? Correct? Indeed, yes. We've worked uh, extensively over the past 20 years with uh, Kuk Phong, uh, mm -hmm. the, the turtle center there, yep. and with the Raphidus uh, program, mm -hmm. um, trying to monitor those animals and potentially get them together for bre yep. breeding. Um, so yes, we have been working in Vietnam. The TSA has been working in Vietnam for at least two decades. Yep. Most of our, our in situ field programs are partnerships with other organizations yes. like a Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, for a lot of our programs in Southeast Asia or Vietnam is ATP, yep, the Asian, Asian Turtle, Turtle Program. program. Yep. Yeah. And then as well as the local governments too, you know, like our Myanmar program would not be what it was without yeah. the Forestry Department yeah. and the support from the Forestry Department. Yeah. Yeah, so in almost all cases, the TSA is partnering yep. with locals and local conservation groups, local um, forestry yep. um, divisions, that type of thing. Um, we're not just in there working. Yep. We're partnering with these groups and mm -hmm. helping to do what needs to be done, you yep. know, with these turtles. And all of our in situ field programs are run from... Uh, people from those countries as yeah. well. There are no Americans over there running these programs. Yeah. You know, we are their oversight, their funding, and we help with husbandry and, and support. But as far as the programs go, they are done in country. Before leaving this area, there's probably one turtle. Yes, we should see. show that one. Yep. 
There are other species here, but this is one that a lot of people like and are interested. Interested in. And we just like to see Chris do yoga. Yeah. <laughs> and get bit, maybe. <laughs> maybe. It's always a possibility. So this oh, guy, yeah. this girl, is the uh, Asian big-headed turtle, mm -hmm. platysternum, megacephalum, flat sternum, big head, megacephalum. Um, they have a long tail like our snapping turtle, although they're their own family. This is the only species in the family Platysternidae. Um, and they live in uh, mountain streams in Asia, primarily China, Vietnam. And then they, then, they, then they kind of have a disjunct population over in Thailand and Myanmar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this, again, is a mountain a stream dwelling species that is an excellent climber. This tail is kind of partially prehensile, so they can use it as leverage. They can climb up waterfalls and rock walls and, and, and straight up cement walls. Straight up cement walls. I mean, they are excellent, excellent climbers. They can't withdraw their head, but their skull is heavily armored for protection. They actually can vocalize a little bit. Um, they do have, uh, for, for an aquatic species that we can actually hear, a lot of aquatic turtles do vocalize, but we can't hear it. Mm -hmm. But these guys, we can. They make these squealing and grunting noises. So um, they're just a really, really neat turtle. Again, difficult for whatever reason for a lot of people to breed in captivity. They were very common in the pet trade for a few decades until they were protected in 2002 from a, a lot of international trade. And uh, But only four places in the United States have ever bred this species in captivity, despite there being probably tens of thousands imported <laughs> over, the, over the decades. This is an adult size, it's an adult female. They can be smaller, they can be larger, but this is kind of your typical adult size for a female. Um, there are, again, some populations that get huge. We, there, there's a breeding female here that's half this size, only 400 grams. She just lays fewer eggs than a, than a big one of this size. And the offspring are a little smaller. The as offspring, well, but not much, yeah, but yeah but pretty much the same. And the offspring, uh, kind of like, uh, similar to, say, like a diamondback terrapin, where in the same clutch you can have multi-colored or patterned yep. individuals. They have the same pattern, but they can be like kind of like yellowish or apple green yep. or orange. They can have yep. these different colors in the same clutch, and uh, and that goes away after about six months, and they turn brown. They also have facial stripes. Yeah, and... facial stripes, and those disappear with age yep. as well. Anyway, very cool turtle. Definitely. One of the four monotypic families of turtles in the world. Yep. Meaning there's only one species left in the entire family. And we work with two of those monotypic families. Correct. This one and uh, our Belize program works with uh, the other one. Central American River Turtle. And the other two are the Leatherback Sea Turtle and the Pig Nose Turtle yep. from Australia and New Guinea. Yep. Pop, um, all of New Guinea, uh, southern New Guinea, so that they have the only freshwater turtle with flippers. So you go sea turtle people, we mentioned sea turtles. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't had any questions about sea turtles. What? I mean, that's okay. We couldn't answer them anyway, we don't know anything about sea turtles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Know a few things about them. We know a few, but we leave that to the experts. I actually yeah. took time to work with them in the wild a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, Turtle Survival Alliance works primarily with freshwater turtles and tortoises, terrapins. Like Chris said, we leave yeah. sea turtling to the sea yeah. turtle people. Mm -hmm. There are seven <laughs> species of marine turtles. They get a lot of attention and most of the funding. There are another uh, 350 odd species that get very little attention and almost no money. So. <laughs> We uh, try to focus on the ones that really are slipping through the cracks and need the most help. And generally is thought that the only, one of the only ways they're gonna survive is through captive management. Okay, so these may be um, questions I need to ask. Before we get started in core complex number one, one yep. um, Wilhelm asked, what is the purpose of the huge head for the big head turtle? Protection, I assume. I mean, it's because they can't withdraw their heads, so they have a thickened skull. 
um, for any potential predators um, that might try to chew on them, mm -hmm. a civet, or I don't know what <laughs> predates them or tries to predate them, but you know. Um, and probably they're uh, mollusk specialists as well. Correct, yes. Um, but we do know that they eat a lot of fruit and vegetables too. You know, originally when this species was being worked with in captivity, they thought they were prim primarily carnivorous, but that's not true. Ours eat tomatoes and sweet potatoes and just about anything that, that looks appetizing, um, they'll, they will eat. And, yeah. and some of the uh, fecal analysis that have been done in the field, it was primarily fruits and mollusks yeah, that they seeds found. Seeds and plants. Yep. and. They do eat a lot of, they, they're omnivores like yep. most turtles. Um, even uh, if you, common snapping turtles are not yep. carnivores. They eat a lot of vegetation as well. Mm -hmm. I've had snapping turtles in my yard, way away from the water, grazing. I have photos of them grazing on raspberries, mm -hmm. wild raspberries. <laughs> so most turtles are not strict carnivores or strict vegetarians. They're, they're, most of them are omnivores. Yep. Not all of them, but most. Okay. And, um, you mentioned the word monotypic, can you? Mm -hmm. Monotypic is... just meaning one. There's one, uh, like a monotypic genus. Yeah. It's the, that genus, say, Leucocephalon, the Sulawesi forest turtle, is a monotypic genus. Mm -hmm. It's the only species in the genus. Mm -hmm. A monotypic family, like the Platysternidae, the, the uh, big-headed turtle we just looked, like, looked at, is the only member, the only species in that entire family. Mono meaning yeah. one, typic yeah. meaning type. Yeah. yeah. One type. Yeah. Good question, Liz. Yeah. And then last before we get into uh, what we're doing in CC1, Dylan, I'm going to butcher this name, Dylan, but um, <laughs> what about the Bagiacheles? Bagiacheles. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Cane turtle. Yeah. Yep. That's a monotypic genus. Genus. Yep. Yep. It's not a family. It's uh, close. It's in the Geomidae family, so closely related to uh, the black-breasted leaf turtle, Geomida spangleri, or Geomida japonica, Which you, and until recently it was Geomida, yep. and um, about 10 years ago it was put into its own uh, monotypic genus. Named so, after the scientist Kelly's, yeah. did a lot of work with them in the field. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool, thank you. Yes, so, but that is not a species we have here. No. Um, right. They're not really found outside of India. Yeah, I don't well, think there are any in the U.S. legal or legally, otherwise. Yep. Um, there are some in captivity in other parts of the world, but not not in the U.S. that I'm aware of, unless yeah. someone unless they're hidden somewhere, yeah. <laughs> which is possible. Which is possible. Well, a lot of turtle me. people are very cryptic, like turtles. So, so, so this is our, another type of uh, Cora complex that we have here. Um, we have a couple of units that are more terrestrial, um, and then a couple of units that are more aquatic in the back for different types. So in the in in um, Asia. There are very terrestrial box turtle species, and then there are highly aquatic box turtle species that live in stream systems. Two or three hours until yeah. we started putting them on camera. <laughs> yeah. So this is Cora macordi, the macords box turtle from Guangxi Province, China. This is a species that's never been documented in the wild by a um, researcher or turtle biologist, although the habitat has been identified. Um, where they used to occur. The last wild known animal was found around 2010. Uh, so this is one of the species that is considered functionally right extinct. They had a very small distribution to begin with um, in modern history. So they're probably kind of like a relic of the last ice age and they were just restricted to this one valley in Guangxi province, China. And um, you know, there might have been less than a thousand to begin with. Uh, then they were all collected out in the 70s and 80s and 90s primarily. And that was it. And so luckily they breed very well in captivity. So the numbers uh, are being brought back up through efforts uh, like in, in Germany, uh, at Munster Zoo. Um, St. Louis Zoo has been uh, a pioneer in breeding these uh, species for a long time. And and Detroit and a few other zoos and also captive um, uh, breeders or private breeders too and co including the person who they're named after Dr. McCord mm -hmm. he has the largest population on the planet and has hatched hundreds of them over the past 20 years and sent them to people yeah, so we can't leave our hometown zoos out we gotta give them that's right. like Detroit yeah 
So uh, before we walk over and maybe see the aquatic mm -hmm. area of this building or complex, in the last complex, there were lots of silver plates laid out. Yeah. And um, I was wondering we have if somebody was going to well. ask that. Yeah. We did not get any mm. questions, but I feel That's like okay. it's important. What do yeah. we feed these turtles and how often do they get fed? Let's talk about, you know, our interns are over there doing a feeding. Let's, yeah, let's talk so about what would, does that entail. This would normally be their next stop, but they kind of bypassed us just because it is quite loud with all the plates. Um, but. Uh, Everything, every turtle here this time of year gets fed three times a week um, in the winter or off season. Uh, anybody that is staying awake that's not dormant gets fed two times a week. Um, and that kind of depends on the species. Like Chris said, most of our turtles, uh, primarily all of them are omnivores, except maybe Chelidina macorda is the most carnivorous species that we have. Um, but today is what we call our salad day. So um, we do a couple different types of salads. We do um, a salad with mixed greens, tomatoes, sweet potato, squash. Um, and then for tortoises, there's a lot more fiber that gets put in there, whether it's Missouri tortoise chow, shout out to Missouri, or <laughs> it's uh, any type of fiber or a Timothy hay gets added to that, as well as the wild greens that we grow all over the property. We grow figs and mulberries uh, and all kinds of other native species that give us that trace vitamins and minerals that your mass produced produce doesn't have in it um, and then the box turtles or any of our we call it the box turtle diet but anybody that's a little more terrestrial will get a very similar diet except it's 50 percent protein so he's a very of protein diet uh sources um trying to use a lot of insects because in the wild these species are, in, are eating a lot of insects and and mollusks and um and worms stuff like that so we try and supplement their diets with that, as well as the aquatics get live prey, worms, and different things like that, or they get some of the pelleted diets from like Zoomed in Missouri, stuff like that. We, we, variety is key for us. We try and keep a massive variety of food for all of our animals, as well as seasonal variability like they'd get in the wild. You know, turtles don't need to eat every day because they've evolved to gorge themselves when they find food. Mm -hmm. Whether that's during the fruit season or more of the vegetable season, they're going to be opportunistic and get what they want uh, or what they can find. So we replicate that with the seasonal grow growth in the United States and what crop is being produced. Um, like I said, it's, it's all donated to us by Limehouse Produce. So whatever comes in, you know, in the fall, we get a lot of gourds. So their diets are gourd heavy. Um, this time of year, we get, uh, we're starting to get a lot of strawberries and stuff like that that are, that are popping up. So it just really depends on the season and what the species is. Uh, we've got 26 species that we manage, so there's a lot of variability in diets. Right. Yeah, and another really cool thing is that a lot of these turtles are living outdoors. So yep. they're, eating, they're, fine, they're foraging on their own with, on wild insects mm -hmm. and aquatic insect larvae. Yep. And, and uh, you know whatever just falls in here from from the wild. Yep. You got a lot of we, slugs. And we've actually and... seen the Vietnamese pond turtles catch and eat an adult water snake yep. and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So and that's not common at all. I think it's only happened once, as far as that I know. Documented. But still, yep. I mean, they're they're finding things outside on their own and eating too. These these Coramacordae don't do anything for seven months. <laughs> it's the end of May. And they are just starting to move around. In fact, we're going to put them together this week for, breed, for breeding encounters. Mm -hmm. But um, they are the ones that they go down the first in October and they come out in late May. They're just, they, they are just they're solid like six, seven months. They do nothing. Um, no feeding, no drinking. They're just buried under a pile of leaves. And uh, so it's pretty incredible. So mo no, I mean, in general, turtles don't eat a lot. We have to be really careful with some species, like the big-headed turtle we just looked, like, looked at. You can overfeed those very easy in captivity. Um, they do not need to eat every day or three times a week. They need to eat one, maybe two times a week uh, to keep them uh, fit. As long as they're getting the proper nutrition, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's what matters. And, and really we, monitor, we monitor their weights. We yeah. weigh everybody twice a year, spring and fall juveniles. We weigh four times a year. So we're staying within what we consider the nor normal range of, of weight for that size animal. Well, and speaking of juveniles and diets, uh, I forgot to mention them. They get fed up to five days yeah, a week, right. depending on their age. Within the first year, it's typically five days a week. 
Species like Chelidynama cordi, uh, it, it's more like six, maybe even seven, just because they are so small and they have seem to have a higher metabolism than most turtles, and they will only eat live prey. Um, so they get a lot of small worms to keep them going. And how do you measure the nutrition balance while feeding them different veggies? So that's a hard one. Um, you know, we've been working with Missouri and other um, organizations to help us establish that. Um, and it's not an easy answer uh, just because we honestly don't know what a lot of these species are eating in the wild. And that's part of the issue that comes with it. Mm -hmm. So we kind of use it as a case by case basis, looking at um, the animal's health in general. And then if they're getting too much of a certain trace vitamin or mineral, you see mineralization um, and, and like in the eyes and stuff like that. So uh, that's one we're still working on, but it's nutrition is a very hard thing uh, yeah. to nail down, especially with so many species and not knowing yeah. what their native natural diets would yeah. be. And even if we did know what they were, you can't necessarily get that here. Yeah. It's what's grow, what's mm -hmm. living in the wild in Indonesia or Vietnam, yep. you just can't get here. The insects, the, the, the micronutrients, mm -hmm. this, all of that, you can't yep. replicate that at all. You have yeah. to give closely what you think, you have to guess. And again, virtually no research has ever mm -hmm. been done on a lot of these species other than the original description, uh, you know, maybe, I mean, ecological studies are lacking greatly for yep. most of these species. And some of them are gone, so it's never going to happen, probably. Mm -hmm. What we know, we know from the wild. I can look at this turtle as, you know, a turtle person and say, oh, that's a box turtle. It's an omnivore. It lives in the forest. And it's eating worms and insects and fallen fruits and stuff like that because I know turtles, you know. But you just, you kind of, when these things were coming in into the pet trade, they weren't even described. Nobody knew what they were, but if you were a turtle person, you had a lot of experience with turtles, you can tell by the shape of the turtle, the, the shape of its head, its mouth, uh, its feet, you know, it, it lives in the water, it lives in the land mostly, um, and you can discern the diet from that. And it's a lot of trial and error. Mm -hmm. So Doug asked, why are there so few Cormacordon males in captivity? Well, um, there's not, a, and it's not really that way anymore. There were males, especially Cora males, stress very easily, very so easily. they get killed by the females or other males. Oh. Or so it's not just Macordi that yeah. there's a shortage of founder males. It's most Cora in general. Yeah. The, in the wild, it's probably not that way. Yeah. But when you bring them into captivity, the they're the first ones to die um, and, and with a lot of stress mm -hmm. or being kept in in less than uh, optimal conditions. Right. Um, and also fighting and uh, like if you're trying to keep a group of turtles the females are going to gang up on the stressed weak male and kill mm -hmm. him I mean that's just that's what happens so mm -hmm. and for a long time people were always incubating eggs at higher temperatures and that's producing all females, females because they have temperature dependent sex determination so all you have to do is incubate them at a lower temperature or let the temperature fluctuate up and down from the low 70s to the low 80s and you'll get males and females or all males mm -hmm. I'm mean, there which is why we have more males now people are focusing yeah. on incubating to hatch four males mm -hmm. so that we don't run out it won't run out but so know. it's not that there's really a potentially less males it's that there are less fewer males in some cases in captivity of these right. different species because of the conditions because of the stress factor and the weakness of males it seems like well and then most people that have them in their collections are more willing to uh move out excess females versus the males yeah. because they're more sought after yeah. okay two more questions before yeah. we move on from this yeah. building uh kyle asks how does the climate compare to native ranges of some of these species he lives in south carolina so how does that's yes. a really South good Carolina. question, actually, yeah. yeah. That's why we chose yeah. this property, was because the climate is very similar yep. to a lot of these species are found at slightly higher elevations. I mean, most people think Vietnam almost be tropical, 85 right. degrees all year round. Northern Vietnam is cold. It's cold. It's very yeah. cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially at higher elevations mm -hmm. where some of these turtles occur. So the climate is very, very similar and is why this is the chosen, one of the reasons we chose mm -hmm. this yeah. location. Uh, because of the optimal temperatures for these animals. And, so, the, and that is based a lot of our collection as well because it's easier to manage these animals 
in a natural environment outside than having a climate controlled building, which is uh, far more expensive but also there's a lot more artificial replication that you have to do. Whereas here they're getting the natural UVB yeah. that they need. They're getting humidity, they're getting rain, they're getting shelter. Um, so all of our enclosures are built to be as naturalistic, but as keeper friendly as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a high, nice hybrid. And do we do anything to about the elevation? You know, there's differences in elevation. Is there any way that we can we are at Account 80 we're at 84 feet elevation <laughs> here so yes. it, it is what it is yeah know? yeah there's not um, much we can we, do about that without pressure chambers yeah. and and most of the elevation that they're at it, it's not to that point where it's crucial to replicate that that atmospheric yeah. pressure right. um, when we have big storms and we have like hurricanes passing by a couple times a year in the fall these turtles, they yeah. their behavior. I mean, they really perk up. They love those kind of yep. things. Low pressure know? systems yeah. are fantastic. Oh, that's cool. yeah. yeah. And our PETA, back to the nutrition, says, do we give any calcium supplements to these animals? We do. Yeah. So uh, that's something we do during breeding season uh, a little more heavily. But throughout the year, we 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 add um, uh, calcium and uh, mineral supplements, um, and especially for indoor animals because. The artificial UVB uh, is not the proper spectrum that turtles need for their bodies to create vitamin D3, which is used to synthesize calcium. So we have to supplement vitamin D3 and calcium for all of our indoor animals, uh, particularly hatchlings. Um, but yeah, we, we do that as uh, because, you know, being animals that use a lot of calcium for eggs and just their general growth, uh, it's something we're always keeping track of. You also mm -hmm. want to be careful not to add too much, much. to overdo yep. it. Yeah. Because one, if you're giving a very diet, they shouldn't need supplementation, just like people. If your diet is well, you shouldn't need to take vitamins or anything like that, supplements. Mm -hmm. So if you have a good, varied diet, uh, hypothetically, they, they shouldn't require supplementation. <laughs> but like Clint said, I mean, especially during the breeding season, giving those females that extra calcium uh, for egg production is, is a good thing. But we also give indoors. them throughout the year, they get yeah. an option of like a calcium block that yeah. they have in their enclosures. If they want that calcium, they can eat the calcium yeah. as well. All right, well, let's move on yeah. to the tortoise barn. And uh, thank you so much for your questions. If you have any more, leave them in the comments section and we will try to ask all, all of them that we can. Didn't you have another one? Oh, we did, yes. Again, I'm probably going to butcher this name, but Wilhelm <laughs> asks for the Geo My Today. Uh -huh. Geo My yeah. Today. Yep. What features uh, do they have that makes them unique? Or, other words, how do you identify a turtle that is Geo Mided? So, first of all, what, yeah, how do you identify what is a Geo Well, that's knowing your turtles, I guess. <laughs> um, because I mean that's kind of a cat, like Amida Day in the United States. Yep. Geo Amida Day is the other is the other major group, the catch-all group to throw every mm -hmm. Asian pond and marsh turtle or mm -hmm. semi-aquatic turtle into. Same in the U.S. or same with North America with the Amida Day, yep. uh, when one species in Europe, the I mean, Orbicularis, the European pond turtle, in Amida Day. Whereas Geo Amida Day, the only New World uh, member is the Rhino Clemmies, the wood turtles. But it's all based on bone, you know, osteology and, and bones and phylogeny and, and you know, genetics. And, and it changes. I mean, all that stuff changes as we learn more. And, um, uh, but it's like this is the Testudna Day, the true tortoises. Yep. Even though it's from Asia. Um, even though it's, it's yeah, well, it's, it's from Asia, Asia but the yep. tortoises are all over the world. Yes, correct. Um, and, and, and they're based on certain uh, features, morphological features, like elephantine type back feet mm -hmm. and primarily terrestrial, uh, but yeah, bones and, and um, genetic lines basically is what determines and paleontology, the fossil mm -hmm. record, that, that also has a, a huge um, a huge factor in determining these different families that um, scientists uh, put together. So, um, 
what is the enclosure in the core complexes made of? The substrate? Is it just leaves? Or? Just dirt, soil, sand, soil, and then we top it off with mulch and, and leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the first two layers, like he said, are, are usually a soil sand, and that's to help with nesting and drainage. Um, especially in some of our aquatic species, it's mixed up fairly well because uh, they need that loamy soil to form their nest cavities. Yes, they're fighting over a plate. Not yeah. really, but... So <laughs> these are the Asian black tortoise. We don't think we mentioned that. These nope. are Menoria no. emmys fairii. Um, there are two species in the genus Menoria. The Menoria emmys, which has the brown and the black giant tortoise. Uh, Asian tortoise, and then there's Menoria impressa, the impressed tortoise. What's really interesting about that genus, those are the only turtles in the world that, that I'm aware of that build an above ground uh, leaf nest, um, like an alligator does. They back sweep all the vegetation and material off the forest floor into a big pile, might be three, four feet high and four <laughs> feet across, and that female deposits the eggs in there they lay large clutches 30 to 70 eggs and um and then that female will actually guard that nest usually for just a few days or a week or so um so there's a tiny bit of parental care there guarding that nest and then then she's gone and that's it and then they're on their own <laughs> yeah. it's not like they take care of the hatchlings or anything or come back but they do will guard the nest for a couple or a few days or a week or so um these guys are um, <clears throat> about 50. That biggest one there is about 50 pounds or 55 pounds. They are capable of getting over 100 pounds, certain individuals. Um, people always ask, you know, or often ask, you know, about the size as well. They're like people too. I mean, yep. some populations or some individuals only get so big and others get huge. I mean, there's a lot of variability in a lot of turtle species mm -hmm. um, in terms of adult size. Like these two here. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. these are old tortoises. They're not getting any bigger. Um, they may grow a millimeter every 10 years yeah. or something, but that's yeah. about it. Indeterminate growth. Yeah. yeah. It just slows down drastically. Mm. There you go. So um, we had a question. Do we have central, back to the core complex, I believe, but do we have a central water treatment system? I think the answer is no. No, everything is a well water, groundwater. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. comes in uh, at, from the aquifer, from groundwater here. So how do we keep it so clean? Because it's constantly flowing. It's mm -hmm. on a trickle system, an overflow system. So it's always trickling in and overflowing out 24-7. We, we cycle them as well. Try yeah. and give them a natural cycle a couple times a year, stir yeah. the bottoms up on them, yeah. remove muck. Mm -hmm. um, just because it builds up from leaf litter and yeah. them kicking um, mulch and other things into the ponds. So. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at the Burmese star. Yes, let's but do we, that. We also have a question. Do we have any Cora Ara Capitale? Ara Cal yeah, we were just looking at them, yeah. although we didn't talk about them. Yeah, we didn't. We were, we were standing there. there. <laughs> I was looking at one. Maybe yes. you guys weren't. <laughs> but yes, we do. Yep. We do, yes. indeed. We have every species of Cora other than Cora uninensis. It's the only Cora that does not exist um, anywhere other than in, within China. Okay. As far as we know, no one's ever taken any out of China, and uh, they're all there, as far as we know. But um, every other species is kept in the United States, uh, not only here, but other locations as well. Mm -hmm. And we are breeding Cora Capitata yes, as we, well. We, bred, mm -hmm. we have now bred um, nine species of Cora, I believe, or ten? Yes, we're at nine, nine yeah. right now. Yep. All right, so we're going in yeah, the tortoise bar now. Hopefully there'll be 11 in the next year or so. Oh, definitely, because we'll hatch Trifasciata this summer, probably. Yeah. Even though I've hatched many Trifasciata, we just never have right here at the center. <laughs> yep. Here's our female uh, Burmese star tortoise, Geocoloni platinota. Uh, this animal was confiscated along with the male that's in here. Mm -hmm. Um, in 2004, uh, it was a wild caught, or we assume wild caught confiscation. Um, and I don't know where it was taken, but they ended up at the Fort Worth Zoo. Um, when they were only about four or 500 grams at the time, so relatively small. And uh, they grew up at the Fort Worth Zoo and then came here in 2014. And uh, we didn't look, but we did have some juveniles in the hatchling room um, from these guys, um, oh. from this female here. Uh, that are now about a, almost two years, or about two years old. 
And uh, so this is a pretty large for this species. Um, they typically don't get this large, but there are some. There are some that are larger than this, but it is um, a, a larger individual than normal. And they are here um, primarily to serve as ambassadors to the Myanmar program. The folks over there, Kaliar and Steve Platt and their team, Mimi So, all those guys have done an incredible job um, breeding this species and getting it back out into the wild. They started in the mid 2000s with um, uh, about less, a little less than 200 uh, individuals and they've hatched over 16,000 now and they're back in two uh, or three preserves, mm -hmm. uh, a few thousand animals that where they're reproducing on their own in the wild yep. again. So this is a species that, um, you know, was functionally extinct for the most part and has been brought back from the, the brink of extinction and yeah. now breeds steadily in the wild. Um, thanks to Forestry Department of Myanmar, TSA, WCS, and all our partners. Yeah. Um, the program it really took off in 2008 and has been, like Chris said, has been just full steam ahead. Um, so we did breed this species once to capture its genetics because, again, it's new to the stud book because they came in as wild caught animals. Mm -hmm. um, so their offspring will be part of the stud book and um, we are not trying to duplicate efforts in Myanmar because uh, our program, the program there is so successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the best conservation stories, I mean, of all time, honestly. Right, yeah. On, rivals the condor, if not even more so. Yeah, because we're talking about thousands of individuals instead of, you know, dozens or yep. hundreds. <laughs> but yes, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And again, from a small group of, like you said, just around 200 animals, now we have tens of thousands of them in captivity and the wild. So. Did you say how old she was? Uh, she came in 2004 as a 500 gram turtle, so she's probably in her like 22, 25, somewhere in yeah. there. Best guess. There's yeah. no a right. way to age a turtle. So. Well, when they're young, you can, you can, when they're, some turtles, when they're young, you can count the seasonal growth rings up to a certain point. But once a turtle's an adult, if a turtle comes to you as an adult, you know, yeah. you, know you don't, you can't yeah. tell how, no one has ever figured out how to age an adult turtle. Yeah. Other than, oh, it might be 30, it might be 80. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. 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 <laughs> it's an adult. That's all we know. Yep. Yeah. So, um, we have two questions. And, and then we might just wrap up. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, what is the first thing you do? Well, are there any risk of any diseases that can spread quickly among turtle species? And then a follow-up from our PETA, what is the first thing you do if they get a lung infection? So two questions. Oh, wow. Uh, yes, there are plenty of diseases, uh, viruses, uh, uh, pat, pat, different pathogens, pathogens. The, uh, um, parasites and stuff that can mm -hmm. happen with turtles. Stuff we don't know about, plenty that we do and know, know about. But yeah, you just, we take a lot of precautions with hand washing mm -hmm. and servicing different areas, mm -hmm. you know, at different times mm -hmm. and... Um, Sanitizing feet. feet and, and All new animals go enclosure. through quarantine yeah. protocols and testing for, for yeah. different viruses. We just do our best. I mean, mm -hmm. turtles carry parasites. They have parasites. They carry different things. Mm -hmm. um, just because a turtle has herpes or adenovirus or whatever else, just like people. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's not going to kill them necessarily, but some things do. Amoeba, yep. certain types of amoeba are, are ravage organs, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah. um, you just got to be as careful as possible. You, there's no there's no possible way to keep all disease yeah. out. I mean, it's just not possible mm -hmm. when you have hundreds of turtles and, and outdoor native wildlife. native wildlife and outdoor mm -hmm. enclosures, but we do our best to mitigate everything. We do a lot of, probably more disease testing than just about anybody. When we send, yeah. when turtles come in, we swab them, we send it off to the lab to see if they have any, anything that we know how to test for. That's the thing, there's plenty of stuff that the turtles know. have that we don't have tests for too, you know, yeah. that we don't know about yet, it's still being discovered. We don't know much about human medicine, let alone turtle <laughs> medicine, <laughs> right. so, and there's no funding for that. So we know what we know and we know how to treat certain things, but a lot mm -hmm. of it, Reptile medicine is some guesswork and mm -hmm. um, um, based on you know previous efforts. So we do our best uh, with that. And what was that second question? Um, 
lung diseases. Yeah, what, what? so respiratory infections, um, they're quite rare here actually. Yeah. We haven't had very many. Um, but typically we, we do, well, we have on-site uh, vet care here. We have a clinic um, that we have uh, just about everything that we need at our disposal, as well as veterinary support um, from our veterinarian and South Carolina Aquarium as well. Uh, typically when that happens, an animal would be pulled inside to a less humid condition, uh, monitored and put on uh, some type of antibiotic. But like I said, I don't know if we've ever had an actual full-blown respiratory infection here. Either. We've had we have mycoplasma. Tortoises have mycoplasma, but they're in optimal conditions, so they don't express it. Um, you, you gen usually, almost never, really. Yeah, it's um, very rare. But if they do, then you just you have to treat it. Uh, one thing you should know about turtle illness is they're extremely reptiles, birds. They mat they cover it up. You don't mm -hmm. know what's going on mm -hmm. usually. Um, if, they, if there's some type of internal infection going on until it's really late in the game, unfortunately, yep. because they don't, they don't show any signs of illness until it's really advanced. Mm -hmm. um, there's some things like mycoplasma, you might see bubbly nose or something, or you test mm -hmm. the animals, you know you have it. Until they're symptomatic, you know, you don't treat. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes down to knowing the species and their behaviors, and yeah. you'll notice behaviors that are off before you notice yeah. something physically wrong with yeah. the animal. Yep. Yeah. Right, but well. yes, it is a it is a something you have to keep on top of all mm -hmm. the time. But yeah, theoretically, with reptiles, turtles, you keep them in optimal conditions, and they never get sick. They might have an accident. They might eat something off the ground that perforates their intestine or something, mm -hmm. but. Theoretically optimal conditions, they just they, they don't they don't get sick generally. Um maybe just one more question. Sure. Um how many so we covered a lot of species mm -hmm. and um animals today, but how many total species and individuals do we have here? Do we have a good count? Yeah, on we that? have yep. uh, tw twenty six species here mm -hmm. right right now. Currently they're not yep. all Managed population managed species. Mm -hmm. uh, some yeah. are just here for education, or like these guys yeah. are not really part of the breeding program here. Um, or they are, and we're missing they, members of the other sex. Yeah, exactly. Or, right. Like we yeah. have one of one species, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and we have 700 individuals mm -hmm. that fluctuates up and down a little bit, but we keep a steady about 700 individuals. Obviously, every year we hatch a bunch and we have to send those out because. Mm -hmm. Until we build more enclosures, we're kind of at max capacity mm -hmm. of about 700 individuals right, right. now. Um, but as we build more enclosures, that will grow. As right. we really get to the full potential of all of the populations that we're, of species that we're managing, we will have um, around 20, you know, between 2,000, 2,500 individuals. Mm -hmm. That was going to require another 900 plus enclosures that we have to build over the next 30 years wow. uh, to get to that point. So. Um, it's it's it, it'll eventually get there, but it's a slow process. Everything in turtles is the yeah. long haul. Yeah, if you're, if you're getting into turtles to have some quick uh, uh, results, you're getting, getting into the wrong business. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have 50 or 80 years to work on turtle stuff, then I mean, it took me 18 years to hatch a, a Uanawai. That's the kind of time frame that you're looking at with some of these things, you know. 10 years, 20 years. Mm -hmm. When you move a turtle from somewhere, it, it, a lot of times it doesn't want to do, it doesn't want to cycle and do its thing for one, two, 10 years, you know? Yep. <laughs> it can be uh, many years until they get back into the cycle of things when you move them. Um, well, there is a plane flying over us right yeah. now, so yeah. hopefully you guys were able to hear everything that Chris just said. But um, what is the best way, one final question from our, um, from our, viewers what is the best way for us to be able to help conserve turtles as citizens i would i, I would for me i would say just be involved yep. and That's try to educate people and just mm -hmm. find the things that you're interested in locally and support it and yeah. and not i mean like the whole think locally act globally kind of stuff yeah mm -hmm. support as many organizations as you can that are doing this kind of work yeah. um and and locally be a a champion for turtles, mm -hmm. you know, uh, volunteer at your local nature centers right. or zoos mm -hmm. or whatever you have in Herb near societies. you. Herb societies. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, 
and just you know try to get the word out there try to get it into people's minds that it's not just sea turtles and pandas that need help yep but there right. are a lot of other species in the world that need yep. help too right there are quite a few turtle species and almost half yeah. of them are endangered so yeah. yep. they do need help um and then i just wanted to say thank you to you both for for joining us today and yep. answering everyone's questions and this was a lovely tour and thank you for everyone who joined in I do want to reiterate that this Turtle Survival Center is not open to the public. Correct. So we are all very lucky that we got to tour it today with Chris and Clint. And thank you guys so much. And I hope we can do this again soon. Happy World Turtle Day. Happy World Turtle Day to everyone.